very talented people sitting next to me. Um, Joyce Hansen is actually from Lexington, so very close to us. She has received four Coretta Scott King Honor Awards, um, one of which was one of my favorites. Uh, I, um, I bought my soul with the rise and fly. <laughs> it's my favorite thing to remember. But uh, uh, I actually remember reading that when I was 11 or 12 years old, and it stuck with me. So I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, you're not going to have you. <laughs> And then Alan, Alan is the author of eight books for young adults. Uh, he received a bachelor's in creative writing and also a master's in English education from the University of Tennessee. And his recent book, which was published last year, is The League of Seven, and I hope that we get to hear some more about that as well. <laughs> we have uh, Samantha Baygood, and she works uh, with Adams Literary, which is a publishing uh, agency, or er, literary. Liter literary agency. <laughs> And, uh, which specializes in publishing YA literature. And, and she's been there for two years, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I necessarily publish um, the books that we represent in terms of the authors and artists that we represent. Very good. And we have Megan. Megan is, has written a trilogy, and she also has a trilogy coming up called The Cage, which I also hope we get to hear about <laughs> as well. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, probably the biggest question is why... Uh, why young adult literature? Why write for young people? And what draws you to that particular audience? And um, is your mic working? Let's see. Yes. 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 Okay. We'll start with you. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I actually kind of fell into it. Um, my, my parents have a bookstore in North Carolina. I grew up in a bookstore, so you think it would make sense for me to write books, but it didn't. <laughs> I didn't think about it until I was in my 20s. Um, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal, and I was there to do environmental education. Um, but I was working with a very small um, elementary school that didn't have much of a library. And the books that they had um, were donated books, European fairy tales, and the kids had a lot of trouble kind of seeing themselves and their culture reflected in these books. And so one of the projects I did uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer was to um, write down all of the village's uh, folk tales, which were um, they spoke with only the oral language, so these stories had never been written down. And we put them into a little book for kids. Um, and that process just kind of really got me excited about children's literature. Um, when I came back to the U.S., I thought, you know, I'm going to give this a hand and try to tell my own stories. Um, and so I started trying to write for younger kids, and it just didn't work. I kept, <laughs> my voice kept getting older and older, and my protagonists kept getting older and older. And I hit, I hit the young adult voice and it just clicked and I, I really loved um, the themes of that age and kind of the, the fast pace and uh, exciting nature of those books. Samantha, why, why young adult literature? Uh, well, I don't write any, but for me, the reason why I wanted to work with young adult authors is growing up, the books, you know, they, they were my best friend. Uh, they were my uh, champion, they were my sword and shield growing up. And now, I feel like I'm giving back, and I'm influencing the youth of today through the authors, and just being able to champion their visions and to share their stories. It's, it's something that, you know, that I can only dream of, and the fact that I'm living that dream day by day, it's, it's, it's always a surprise and always amazing. And so, that's just being a reader growing up, that's what wanted me to get into this. <laughs> I, uh, I knew I wanted to be a writer from a very young age, and I, uh, I, but I didn't know exactly what. I tried a lot of things as I grew up. I wrote short stories, and then was start work. I wrote plays that were produced in Knoxville, and uh, I tried writing TV scripts and movie scripts, and uh, none of these things ever sold. <laughs> I tried comic book scripts. I was also writing novels, and um, then my wife. Uh, had a job as the book and toy buyer for a group of independent bookstores, and uh, uh, for, the, for the kids' book section. And she was bringing home books like uh, Philip Pullman's Golden Compass had just come out, and Lawrence Hall, Hall Sanderson's Speak had just come out, and she was like, these are amazing, you have to read this, read this, read this. And uh, I read them, I loved them, and I said, you know what, this is where my heart is, this is what I want to be doing, I want to be a part of this renaissance that's happening in young adult literature. And so I put all the other things aside and really began to focus on writing for kids. And um, about the same time I was going to graduate school, 
to uh, to become a, a, to get a teaching certificate and become an eighth grade English teacher. So my heart was already in middle school there too. I was doing a lot of reading of young adult literature to prepare for that. And uh, so the, the 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 planets aligned for me to to be writing kids books, and uh, I couldn't be happier. It's where I want to be. Good evening. Um, I started. Um, I always wanted to write, but I didn't think that I would be a, a child, write for children. I was trying to write for adults and getting a lot of stuff thrown back at me. Nothing was selling. But at the same time, I was also a school teacher. And I was getting um, my master's degree, and I decided that I didn't want to do a research paper, but that I'd like to do a, um, a more creative type project. So I wrote this little children's book, kind of because I was teaching seventh grade at the time. So some of the book was based on this, my students. And my professor said he thought it was publishable. And that was my first book. And it was, as I said, I had not planned to be a children's writer but I found that I was influenced by the children that I taught. And that um, I also found that um, if you want to write for children, I think what's important, it's okay you know, to be around children, but you don't have to be around children. I think there's some children's writer. There was a children's writer who didn't like children. <laughs> I can't remember who it was. You, you really don't have to be around children, but I think it helps, and certainly helped me as a writer being around high school age kids and middle school age kids, but you also have to remember what it felt like to be a child. I think that's the most important thing. So even though I'm influenced by the students I work with, but my own childhood comes into it too. Well, tell me, um, I'm gonna stick with you since okay. you have a microphone. <laughs> um, tell me about your writing process. Do you set a certain amount of time aside to write? Do you set certain days? Is it structured? And do you prefer to have an outline, like with a plot, or do you prefer to just kind of let it go wherever it goes? Um, I have, all my life, I have had to fight for time to write. Um, uh, because I, when I started writing, I was also working, teaching full time. But I do try to be structured. I try to write every day when life doesn't interrupt, but sometimes it interrupts. But often it interrupts. But what I had to learn was that, and this is what I've told students too, even if it's only for a half an hour, um, a half hour some days, just try to write something every day. And, and that's what I try to do. The days when I don't have to go food shopping or laundry, laundry, those are good days when I could just stay in the house all day long and write, but that's, that's real. Um, and I know I, I only work from an outline if I'm writing nonfiction, because then I, I know the, the, what the subject is, what the setting will be, and the points that I have to make. But when I'm writing fiction, um, if it's historical fiction, I start out by reading, uh, getting a good history book to give me some kind of background about the historical setting that I'm working, working with. If it's, if it's pure fiction, then I, I usually start with, just, a, just start out writing in a notebook. I start all my writing in a notebook. I guess it's something because of my age. It's still the eye-hand coordination. I can't create on the typewriter, so I start. Oh, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say computer. <laughs> And, but I, I start out, I start everything out in a notebook, and um, once I fill up a notebook, and that may be take me to about three or four chapters, five chapters maybe, um, I'll, then I'll go to the computer, um, do a draft, a rough, rough draft, uh, triple, triple space, and once I, I get something on the computer, then I print it out and I start writing by hand again, filling in those, those triple spaces. I do a lot of rewriting. I write about, about four or five drafts before I have anything to send to, the, uh, to, to my editor. So I do a lot of rewriting. But the fiction, yes, I let that, that comes to me. I, I do, oh gosh, I start out with one beginning and end up with another one 
my endings are different from the ending that I had planned. I'd like something to come to me when I wasn't even thinking about it. And, and, and that makes sense when I'm struggling with the, you know, when I'm struggling with a part of the story. I just like to wait until the answer comes, so to speak. And uh, so I just do an awful lot of rewriting. Alan, same question. Sure. So uh, I started writing full time in 2002. Um, I had been working on books in my evenings and my weekends and my summers when I was teaching, um, but at a very slow pace because life gets in the way when you want to be writing, of course. Uh, then in 2002, my daughter Josephine was born, and my wife and I had decided if one of us was going to stay home and take care of her, or if we were going to ship her right off to daycare. And my wife, in words that will live in infamy in our household, said, You've wanted to be a writer since you were a kid. You've been working on it in your evenings and weekends and summers. Why don't you quit your job, stay at home, and become a full-time writer and a stay-at-home dad? So at first, I was, of course, much more of a stay-at-home dad than I was a writer. And this was a huge leap for us because at this point, I had not sold a book. Um, but I started to find time, especially while my daughter was sleeping or when I hand her off to my wife when she got home from work, and, um, and would jump into my office and get to work. And the way that I was able to work in short verse was I learned to outline. And uh, really, the very first book that I ever outlined was the very first book that I sold, Samurai Shortstop. And I was able to sell that before my daughter turned one year old. That was the first book I wrote while I was a stay-at-home dad and, and my first sale. Uh, after having written two books and been sending them out and getting rejection letters and rejection letters. Um, and really, I taught myself to outline to be able to jump into writing and say, this is what I have to write, and I have two hours to write it, and I'm going to go. And also because it was historical fiction, and I had a lot of research to keep track of, and a lot of story structure to keep track of. So now I outline everything, um, and um, I work from note cards off of a big board where I build the story, take it back over to the computer when I've built that, type it up and into, um, into a more formal outline on the computer, then I add any research notes to those chapters, so that when I sit down to write, uh, and, and I, I, I can say, I'm not writing a 300-page book today. I'm writing a seven-page chapter, and here's exactly what's going to happen in that chapter, and here are the notes I need to tell just that part of the story. And that way, I can really know going into my office that I'm going to get words on the page. The writer's block that I get now comes when I'm building the outline, trying to figure out what the story is. Uh, I know a lot of writers find that in their first drafts, but for me, I outline the, the heck out of it, and then take it over and write that draft. So now I'm a full-time writer. My daughter's in school, so I don't have to do the dad thing you know, during the day. And uh, so I'm, I'm really lucky. I get uh, six or eight hours to write, uh, of which I probably write for an hour and a half because the rest of the time I'm on Facebook. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> the administrative and the promotional stuff can really take over your time, though, if you let it. So um, I like to get in about six hours of work on a book during the day, though. <laughs> um, I'm a full-time writer now as well. Um, when I was writing my first um, book that got published, The Madman's Daughter, I had a day job. Um, and so I was writing that evenings and weekends. Um, but now that I am a full-time writer, it is very challenging to kind of try to stick to a schedule. And I, I tend to be someone who likes structure, and I'm pretty self-disciplined. But it's different when it's about writing. <laughs> Um, I, I think I have the cleanest house I've ever had. <laughs> like, I'll do anything before writing. Um, and so basically, I've learned that I just have to do whatever it takes, you know, that there's no excuses. And as much as I want to stick to a nine to five writing schedule, life gets in the way, or the business end of this job gets in the way. And so I just have to, you know, be honest with myself and say, you know, what do I need to accomplish today or this week? And how am I going to do that? And some days that means getting up at 5 a.m. and writing super early. Um, some days that means writing all night. Um, and I tend to, uh, I, I like to work in um, kind of bursts of, of energy, especially with first drafts. And so I might write for 10 to 12 hours a day for a week or two, and then I'm totally burned out. You know, and so then I'll do something else for a week or two to kind of rest and clear my mind. Um, 
you know, sometimes that works for me. Other times, I need to just do more like, okay, I'm just going to write for an hour a day or two hours a day. And it often depends on the kind of story I'm telling um, and what part of the process I'm in. Um, if I'm drafting, I tend to get way more excited about the story and get, really get into it deep. If I'm editing, it feels more like work. <laughs> and then I you know, might not work on it so much. Um, but uh, my process, it, it varies with... Uh, with each book, um, and again, it's sort of like whatever whatever works. Um, and so, some books I have outlined very heavily as well. Um, some books I've almost written in my head before I ever even write a word down, just purely the brainstorming and thinking through um, the characters and the plot twists, and um, even before the outlining stage, I kind of know what the book is going to be. And then other books. That hasn't worked, that's felt too artificial or too stiff, and I've just thrown out all my outlining, and I've just started with chapter one, go, and just written, and sometimes that works. Um, so I've kind of given up the idea that there's a structure that's going to work for me, um, and just kind of muddled, muddled through it. <laughs> Would you mind telling us about your upcoming trilogy, The Cage? Um, sure. My first trilogy, The Mad Man's Daughter trilogy, is historical fiction. Um, and and it's, there's three books, and they're all based on different Gothic classics like Frankenstein and Jekyll and Hyde and The Island of Dr. Moreau. And so my next series, The Cage, is sci-fi. Um, it's about six teenagers who are taken from different parts of the world by an otherworldly, um, all-knowing race, and they're put in a human zoo. So it's sort of a biosphere where, where all of Earth's different habitats and time periods and cultures are sort of mismatched and crammed together, and they have to figure out exactly why they're there and, and if they can get out. Um, so, you know, it seems quite different to go from historical fiction to sci-fi. Um, but the books are actually similar, I think, just because they're all young adult books, you know, so they all deal a lot with um, just kind of learning who you are, who you are in the world, you know, how you fit into the world, um, you know, romance, excitement, everything about that, that age. Great, thank you. Um, Samantha, I have a question for you. Speaking of uh, trilogies, so we had talked uh, before this, and I asked you, um, is it usually like a publisher who says, um, you're, I, you know, you have this idea and we're going to make it into a trilogy, or does the author kind of come up to you and say, I have an idea for a series, here it is. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about that? It's always definitely the author's idea. If they, if they have a story and they say, you know, this is the first book I'm intended trilogy or an intended duology, then you know, well that's that's what we'll try to sell it as. That's your vision, that's your story, and that's what we want to try our best to do. And sometimes though that when we read the manuscript um, and we read you know the synopses of the next book or the next two books, um, we'll discuss with the author like would this work as a trilogy or can it just work as a duology? I mean you you can see in the market now there's a lot of trilogies. Um, um, and so, you know, sometimes there might be some fatigue after seeing so many. Uh, so you might start seeing a lot of duology books, a lot of these two book stories. Um, but it's, we, everyone always tries to follow the author's vision foremost um, for, the, for every story. Yeah. Sorry, I also just want to add that I am fortunate enough to be represented by Adam's Literary. <laughs> Um, and so I work with Sam and, and Josh and Tracy, who are the agents there. And um, it, for the first book, uh, I had written it as a standalone, and, and Josh suggested, would you want to expand this to a trilogy? Which was always in the back of my head. I just didn't want to be the one to say it. So I was really <laughs> glad that he suggested that. All right, my next question is for you, Alan. Would you, or it's not really a question, um, it's a request. Would you mind telling us about uh, The League of Seven, your most recent book? Sure. So uh, League of Seven. Uh, the first book came out last year, and uh, this book is the story of seven super-powered kids who battle giant electrical monsters using airships and ray guns and clockwork machine men. Um, <laughs> um, different from, from a lot of the other stuff I've written, uh, which has tended to be historical or sports or, or mystery. Um, I love fantasy, I love steampunk. Um, that's what this book is, a, a world where the, the, everything, the technology is driven by steam or clockwork power. and um, and not electricity. And uh, I basically, I got the idea for this, the whole trilogy. I was talking to my wife one night. I said, the next book I want to write, I want to write a book that is full of awesome. And 
And I said, I want it to be so awesome that like 10-year-old me, when he went into the library to check it out, or to look for books, would see this book and it would call to him, like, Alan, check me out. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, it's, it's just going to be, it's going to be awesome, packed full of awesome stuff. And my wife said, that sounds great. What's it about? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> so um, the next day I went into my office and I put up on that big board where I usually outline my books, a card that said, full of awesome, right on the middle of the board. And then I started, I had a, I had a deck of index cards and I started saying, what's awesome? And I put up ray guns and airships and giant monsters and brains and jars, which I thought was pretty awesome, and submarines and steampunk Native Americans. And I put all this stuff up on the board and I still didn't have a story though. So I sat back for the next couple of weeks and tried to find the connections between the ideas. What connects submarines to mad scientists, or ray guns to giant monsters, or secret societies to heads and jars? And so I, I began to build a story out of that, a story that, that was bigger than one book, a story that I saw being a trilogy. I'm um, guilty of, of the trilogy thing as well. Um, and um, and the, the League of Seven was born. So the, the first book, The League of Seven, is out. It came out last year. The next book is called The Dragon Lantern, and it comes out this summer. And the third book is called The Monster War. And it comes out next spring. But that's the genesis of the League of Zen. Well, um, I really like the cover and the fact I was going to ask you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just okay. yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> promise. Um, what, as the author, what say do you get in the uh, cover? If you, anything, usually nothing. Okay. Um, and, and usually my, I don't know if this is different for Megan, but probably the same for most of um, Usually what happens is I get zero say and it pops up in my inbox and, and the editor says, here it is. She doesn't even say, what do you think, because they really don't care. They don't, they, they want to know if you love it, but they do not want to hear if you don't love it, because they're not going to change it. Um, this is the only time, that, so I, I had seven books previous to this one, and uh, this was a new publisher for me, Tor, and uh, my editor emailed me and said, what do you want the cover to look like? And I said, are you sure that you didn't mean the art director on this email? You're, you, you sent this to the wrong person. And she said, no, no, I'm really asking. So I said, look, I'm not an artist. I don't know what a good cover should look like. But I can tell you some of my favorite artists. So I put together a Pinterest board of my favorite book design, my book illustrators and, and comic book illustrators. And I had little notes with them. And on one of them, I put, I put Brett Helquist's work. He did the, uh, the Liberty Snicket books, the series of unfortunate events artwork. Love it. And I put some artwork up there and I said, I know we can't afford Brett Helquist, but if you could find somebody who draws just like him, that would be awesome. And about a month later, my editor called me up and said, so we hired Brett Helquist to do the cover. It fell out of my chair. So uh, it's the only time I've ever gotten input. And I didn't tell him what to draw. I said, whatever Brett wants to draw is awesome. <laughs> do not tell him I do that's how to give him any direction. Uh, and I absolutely love the covers for these. So I've uh, been really, really thrilled. Um, I think they, they are full of awesome, which is what I was shooting for. Um, and a lot of kids have picked up the book just because of the cover alone. And as we all know, we were told, don't judge a book by its cover, but we all do it. Um, especially kids. They're going to see a book, and if it's got an intriguing cover, they're going to pick it up and read it. If it doesn't, they're not. So I, I got really lucky with that, and I've been fortunate to have, I think, good covers from all of the designers who worked on my books, but usually, no say whatsoever. Thank you. Um, Joyce. <laughs> um, so you write every day. Is there anything upcoming that we should be? Well, my my last book was published in 2010, um, and it's called Homes with Our Family. It's historical fiction, and it's based on a family in 1856, a free black family in 1856 in New York City, in an area they lived in lived in an area that is now Central Park. Those of you who know. You don't know Central Park. But at that time, that was, there was a small enclave of mostly um, uh, blacks, um, Italian, German, and Irish immigrants living in this area. Uh, and they had their own school, um, their homes, and but the city decided to, um, to build Central Park. So they had to leave. So the story reads primarily, that's the background of the story, how this, 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 they got together, they petitioned the city. And a lot of that is based on, 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 on truth. I found a, a petition that people who actually lived there made wanting more money. The city wasn't giving them enough, more, enough money, they felt, for their property. But um, 
the plot kind of revolves around it, the main character, who has this friend who's a little different from all the school friends, and she finds out that she is really an escaped slave. So I talk about slavery in New York City, which a lot of people never think of New York City as being a place where there were slaves, but there were slaves. There were a lot of runaways uh, because people could kind of blend in. There was a lot going on. There was a big trade in kidnapping people that told me as a slave, uh, I have that. This girl had someone trying to get her to bring her back south. Anyway, that was the last book. I, now, that was supposed to be part of a series, but the publisher decided not to go on with the series. So, I, to answer your question, that's the wrong way to answer. <laughs> but to answer your question, I'm, I'm continuing the story anyway. Um, and I have this family now, they're moving on to Kansas, also in, in 1856 during the period known as Bloody Kansas. So I'll give some of that, uh, some of that background. So that's what I'm working on now. Great. And of course I have to ask, how, did it, um, how excited were you when you got the Coretta Scott King honors? Oh, I, the, <laughs> first, the first time, I, that was my first historical fiction, which way freedom. I was just hoping that people weren't angry with me because I wrote something that was just all cool and crazy. And uh, um, you know, and I was imagining these horrible reviews. And then when I got this letter saying that it had one uh, for the Star King on it, I, I can't tell you how thrilled. I still have the letter. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, that. all four of those. Very special to me, but I am the Susan Lucci of the Coretta Scott. I'm waiting for the main one. Yes. <laughs> um, now, if you could go back and uh, if you had a time machine, you could go back and tell yourself um, to do something different in some part of your writing experience or a publishing experience, would you? I mean, is there anything that you would yeah. advise yourself? You know, so when, I, when I was a kid, I loved to read poetry. I really, really loved poetry, but as an adult, I've never tried to write it. I have a little bit of poetry in some of my books, but it's the character who wrote the poetry. In other words, the character I created created the poem, not me. So, I, but I've been thinking lately that I think I'm going to have to try it and see what happens. Because I go back to maybe read more poetry and just go back to some of the poems and reading poetry that I so much I don't know why I didn't continue with it. So that's something I might try. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joyce. And the same question for you, Alan. Yeah. If you could get the time to change, what would you tell yourself? So um, that's a tough one. I was thinking about that. I mean, there's a lot of things I would tell myself. But um, the, the biggest thing, perhaps, is that uh, when I started, I didn't have a clear vision of what was going to be next, and what was going to be next, and what was going to be next. You're so focused on selling your first book that um, you, you just want to get your foot in the door. You just want to make that first sale. So then I did. Right. Uh, I did, and um, I immediately thought, well, I guess I need to follow this up with a historical. And I started working on another historical novel uh, because my first was, and it, it never clicked. It, did, it wasn't right. And I suffered that sophomore jinx of trying to write a book and, and it not working out. And so I, I said, you know what, forget that. I'm going to do something else I'm really excited about. And I wrote a, a, a young adult mystery. And I'm really proud of that, and I love that. Um, but then I went and did a, uh, another historical and a fantasy novel and sort of bounced around. And, and I guess what I would go back and tell myself is um, sort of maybe pick one thing and stick with it. As much as I love all those different genres, um, there is something to be said. It's, it's seen as a dirty word sometimes, but there is something to be said for branding yourself as an author so that, um, so that when young readers see your name on a book, they know what they're going to get. They know what to expect. I mean, we think about authors like Sarah Desson, we were talking about her at dinner tonight, um, or in, you know, on the um, like the sports side, like Lubica, something like that, where where kids know I'm going to get a certain kind of book. It's always a different book and different characters, um, but really, it's taken me a long time. And I think what I'm what I'm falling into is sort of action adventure books for boys and. And, and maybe even specifically down the road, thrillers, but where they can be contemporary or historical. But trying to find that focus <laughs> so that there's enough freedom for me to still do a variety of books and not feel like I'm writing the same book over and over again, but also feel like I'm not being so scattershot. So um, I suppose that's what I would go back and say, like, um, 
plan for success. Um, it's so hard to think like that because you, before you've been successful, you just think, all I want is to sell a first book. But then you sell your first book and you think, all I want to do is sell a second book. And then it's the third book. And then you look back and maybe you've got, you're lucky to have five books out and you think, oh, maybe I should have thought about what those five were going to be you know, to get to this point. Um, so that's, I think, where I would, what I would say. Think, plan for success. I'm going to come back to you with <laughs> the negative question. Um, I think, too, like Alan said this a little bit, but before I was published, um, I very much thought it was a journey, and the end of the journey was getting published. And I really didn't think beyond that. I thought, okay, then, you know, I'll be a published author, and that's, that's it, you know, the goal. And now that I am a published author, I've really learned it's just the start of an entirely different journey. And that has taken a lot of getting used to. Of course, there's all the business side. Um, there's a big emotional toil to it. You do have to be very self-disciplined. Um, but I think I would also tell myself, you know, when I decided I wanted to write young adult literature, I went out and read hundreds of young adult books, all the prize winners, all the bestsellers, good books, bad books. I just wanted to really familiarize myself with genre, and that's a good thing to do, but I think the mistake I made was not reading more widely outside of that genre, because if you, if you only read one type of book, your voice starts to sound like all of those books, and it starts to sound a little more generic -y. And I, and I wish, um, you know, going back, you know, five, ten years, um, I had focused also on reading, you know, high fantasy and sci-fi and historical and nonfiction and adult fiction. And, and I did that a little bit, but I wish I had, had understood a little bit more then how important it is to have that breadth and understand how many voices there are out there. Um, and it's okay, you know, it's okay to just go write YA and but still be familiar with all those other ones. Great. And uh, can I, I have one more question before I break uh, for Samantha? Um, could you tell us about your agency, what you do, what you, um, who you represent? So, Adams Literary, we represent, we exclusively represent children's and young adult authors and artists. We represent their interests, so um, the books that they sell, not just to the publishing houses here in the States, but um, their translation rights, so uh, international um, publishing. Uh, we work with co-agents on the international markets and trying to sell their rights there. We work with uh, co-agents in the film and TV industry. Um, and just, yeah, we always just, it's just basically representing uh, the interests of the authors. Thank you. And I believe it's time for our break. We're going to take 15 minutes. We have coffee and some cookies over there. Please help yourself.